everybody. This is Diane. Welcome to Biters. And this is Marnell. And there are more kids in my damn apocalypse. <laughs> and and this have... is Tom. Yes, we have a special guest tonight, Tom O'Mara. How you doing, Tom? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's awesome to have you back. Yeah, it's been a while. I think the last last time I did this, I think it was last November. Oh gosh, has it been that long? Yeah, it, it was feel like it. It was towards the very beginning of the Walking Dead season. Okay. And here we are with the fear premiere. Yes. And you and would just who, say who would have thought who would have thought I would ever do a Fear of the Walking Dead podcast after the first couple seasons. Not only that, but I'm guessing you probably have the highest rating for this premiere. Um, I, well, that's to be determined, but I, I would assume that I, that I do. So I'm, I'm taking it. You guys didn't like the episode. Um, I liked it a lot better when I rewatched it. I will be honest and say, I don't think I was in the right frame of mind the first time I tried to watch it. So I'm just the opposite. I liked it on the first watch, but it lost me on the rewatch and I have mixed feelings about it. Like, we'll get into it. But I I have a lot of good stuff and a lot of bad stuff. And it's all pretty minor. So, I mean, I still love the show. I'm, you know, I love the Alicia and, and yeah. Well, you, we'll guys, you guys know my first watch was on a big screen in New York City. With yes. so. part of the cast. Yes, there was uh, about seven cast members, I think, and Scott Gimple. But uh, yeah, I watched. I've actually watched it probably three times now. Was Coleman so, there? Coleman was there, and he was in the wildest suit I think I've ever seen him in. He has a very interesting dress. Yeah, <laughs> sunglasses on uh, Talking Dead. I yeah. I'll I'll post I'll post some pictures on the Biter's Facebook page, but Very yeah, cool. he good. he had a pretty wild outfit on. He just I seems like a really big presence. Yeah, I mean that's just his style. Every mm -hmm. every time I see him, like he's done some Walker stalkers, and he always has a a pretty wild outfit. So God bless, it's his his style. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I've, I see him on Instagram every now and then. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and you know, though, he is if a anyone super nice pull, guy. If, if anyone can pull it off, you know. Strand can. I would <laughs> agree. I think that, that he definitely has some panache. Yes. Well, Big Tom, since you're the guest, why don't you tell us what your rating is first? My rating... I'm sure I'm going to be the highest is 4.65 chomping, chomping tree heads <laughs> out of five. Marn, what was yours? Uh, mine was 4.25 human coat racks. Oh man. Now I'm feeling really bad. Wow. You're lower than that. Yes. So mine was a 3.5 out of five human coat racks. <laughs> wow. The same the same rating. Mm -hmm. We uh, think a lot of like, we, we do that pretty often nowadays. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> we can depends. be a force to be reckoned with. I was going to say, it depends on what we're thinking. <laughs> so, Diane, you said you liked it better. The set. What was your rating before the second viewing? Oh, I don't even want to think about what my rating would have been. And I have to once again say, I just think I wasn't in a good frame of mind. I was really tired and frazzled. And we had just come back from, I'm embarrassed to admit this, purchasing a new TV. Um, because What's wrong with purchasing I just, a new TV? What was that? What's wrong with purchasing a new TV? Oh, you know, it just seems so... It, it was really a big splurge. So we didn't necessarily need one, but we were having issues with our main television in the living room in terms of being able to stream stuff. And I thought, uh-uh, this is one thing that's giving me pleasure right now. I'm going to have a good TV. <laughs> Did you get the 100-inch? 
No, no, no. We don't have room for that. We got a 65 inch TV. So. Oh wow. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. And uh, much better picture quality. No problem streaming, which has been really nice. So. Do you get a good sound bar? Because you'll need it for Walking Dead. So we actually have a Bose sound system. Okay. Yeah. Ah, so do I. Yeah. And so I- nice. Of course, you'll need the uh, clearer picture for season eight of Game of Thrones. (laughs) I'm not there yet, man. (laughs) I don't watch it. (laughs) I'm not going down that rabbit hole. Oh, it's a big rabbit hole. And and just to diverge a little bit, because I know we'll diverge a lot tonight. um, The Walking Dead cast, they are on the Podcastica network, and they have a podcast called House Podcastica where they covered Game of Thrones. And I'm trying to get to the point where I can start their podcast. (laughs) Hmm. (laughs) You'll catch up. Yeah, I will. I uh, I've invested a lot of time and energy in it already, which is kind of sad. I should probably be investing my time and energy in other things. But like I said, it's giving me pleasure. So there you go. I just love that I peer pressured you into watching it. Uh, I don't think it was just you. I think it was kind of the general gestalt after the the finale. Yeah, I'm still taking credit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do have a few numbers. I actually was able to get online tonight and find a rating for the the first day of viewing. So this episode of Fear actually had 1.97 million views for Sunday, which put it on the top of the, the cable ratings. And it Can had you the, believe that? Can number I believe one. how big it was or can I believe that it was number one? Uh, all of the above. I mean, we're talking about Fear the Walking Dead here. The thing that we all were going to give up on like right? two seasons ago. I mean, it's still about a little less than half of the numbers that we're seeing for Walking Dead, but it's getting respectable numbers. Still number one. Yeah. Still number one. Yeah. And la- well, the thing is, last season was so incredible. I, I mean, agree. to me. Yeah. I actually liked last season of Fear better than season eight of the walking dead hmm that's tough i'm not sure if i'm not sure i could could uh delineate season eight I, season eight of the walking season, season eight nine. season eight okay yeah 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 i can see that i can no, see season that. nine season nine of the walking dead picked it back up yeah but. season nine was great i've been kind of listening to some stuff about i listened to a, a wrap up on another podcast of season nine and just really thought back about how much i enjoyed it I mean, I still think that episode Laura from season four of Fear is one of the best episodes of TV I think I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And we'll I talk mean, I, about who was behind that. We will. And I, I actually, I, I tell, like, I don't know if you guys know, I, I haven't been on here, but I've become a little, little friendly with Jenna Elfman. So I tell her all the time that Laura, Laura is the best episode of TV I've seen in years. I bet she's really flattered when she hears that. She's flattered all the time. I mean, she's just an incredibly nice person. She's very gracious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love what she's bringing to this character. And that actually, I mean, we'll get into our goods, bads, and uglies here in a few minutes. But that was actually one of the highlights of this episode for me. Oh, uh, was Jenna? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, don't steal my good. <laughs> <laughs> so before we move out of the numbers, I did just want to observe that the new series Nosferatu made the top 25 for cable ratings on Sunday as well. I did, did not you guys watch, watch it. Did you guys? No. Nope. I didn't watch it. I uh, But I don't know how much I trust those numbers yet. Because didn't they put that right bumped up against fear? And that's yes. what I was going to say. So they did what I hate. Yep. AMC they forced did. you. Yes. They forced you to watch it if you want to watch Talking Dead. Right. And now, I heard... we all just DVR'd Talking Dead and watched it on exactly. Monday. Right. That's what I did. I heard a rumor that they're not going to do Talking Dead for fear, that they're only doing it for the premiere and for the finale. Uh, well, Chris Hardwick said when I uh, I watched it the other night, and 
I think he said they're going to do the mid-season finale. Ah, uh, okay. So they might do, maybe they'll do the premiere, the mid-season, the mid-season premiere, and then the finale. Huh, I think that's really interesting that they're not doing it for the whole series. Yeah. Yeah, it might be, it might be a ratings thing. Yeah, I'm kind of disappointed because although I didn't pay super close attention to this episode of Talking, this is definitely, I mean, it's definitely part of my whole Walking Dead viewing you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I love, I love Talking Dead because you get all those behind the scenes, right? Clips and interviews all, with all the that. actors yeah. and cast and crew. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, and I can only, I can only text Jenna so often. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they give Easter eggs that you wouldn't necessarily find elsewhere. You know. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So about the title, did you guys have anything specific about the title? I mean, I thought it was pretty explanatory. I didn't know if there was a particular line that it came from. Okay. Morgan said it, didn't he? Here's 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 my lack of preparation. I have no idea what the title oh, was. Oh, that's so funny. The title is Here to Help. Oh, wow. I didn't even know that. <laughs> so we'll go with what Marnell said. Morgan must have said it. Yeah, uh, I'm... I, I'm, uh, I don't know, was it Morgan? No, it was Alicia. Alicia, when she came upon the kids. Did she say it to the kids? I oh, think you're she right. Said, I think she said we're here to help. I'm, I think I'm thinking of um, the, the intro, the, the voiceover intro that Morgan, that um, Lenny did. The oh, right. previously seen on Fear the Talking Dead, or Fear the Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah. and that's, uh, I, I know he said, don't worry, we're coming. He did. Um, right. Yeah, but I I thought he said here to help, but no, you're right. I'm pretty sure Alicia said it. I mean, it could have been, it might have been said a few times. I think uh, Luciana may have even hinted at that when she was talking to the kid, explaining what they were doing. Yeah. But I don't know. I remember Alicia saying, I don't know if everyone, I, it may have been said a couple of times. They're doing a really crappy job of helping, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can't find anybody who wants to be helped. Yeah. Yeah, they That's they true. even said it. They said this is the first group that actually wanted to be found. Yeah, people are either and, dead or not wanting to be found. And, and it turns out they didn't want to be found. Right. Yeah. Even the kids didn't want their help. <laughs> like 12-year-olds are like, no, we're good. And we know how great kids do in this world. Right. <laughs> I have questions oh. about the kids. So Well that yeah, don't don't ruin my bad now either. All right. We, very good. Yeah, we're <laughs> gonna talk about the kids, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so just very quickly, the showrunners um were the writers for this episode. So Andrew Chambliss and Ian Goldberg wrote wrote this episode. Uh, Marnell, I thought of you because Andrew Chambliss worked on Dollhouse quite a bit. Ugh, love Dollhouse. And then they both worked on Once Upon a Time, and I can't remember if they worked on Once Upon a Time together or if that's just where they kind of intersected. Um, so funny how many crossover from that show. Mm -hmm. And um, there is an interview with them about this episode at EW if people want to follow up on that. I didn't really thoroughly read it, but I noticed it. They were they were also on Talking Dead, I think. Yes, they were. You're right. Um, our director was Michael Satrazimus, who is known for this, the original series, The Crow. And um, as we were talking about, he was responsible for Laura. Yes, he was. He was also responsible for The Grow yes. in The Walking Dead. Do you know where he started? I don't think I do. He started as a grip on one of my favorite movies of all time. Mine too. Oh, so you read it too. What my movie? Cousin Vinny. Oh. He started as a grip on My Cousin Vinny. Wow. And now he's got two of the hottest TVs on television. Yep. he's. I, I put him right there with Greg Nicotero. Yeah. He directs. He directs all of the best Fear episodes. He still. I think he still directs some Walking Dead, but all the best Fear episodes are directed by him. 
He is still directing for Walking Dead because he directed Guardians in season nine. Right. So he directed one of my favorite mini series, and seriously, if you're a sci-fi fan and if you're not, if you've not seen it, I know I've talked about it on the show before. It's called The Lost Room. Hmm. Um, and it, uh, yeah, it's. Um, I thought it had uh, the guy who plays John Dory, but it just looks like the guy who plays Don- oh, John Garrett. Dory. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it's such a good show it it was only i think four episodes long and it's just yeah i love that miniseries every time it's on sci-fi i like have to watch it i have never heard of it i'd never heard of it either but these are crazy (laughs) speaking of michael satrazimus I actually had the chance to chat with him yesterday. Uh, I was going to try and get him to come on, but the whole scheduling thing with them filming and everything wasn't going to work out. But he told me I could ask him questions, and he was very, very nice. That's so gracious of him to be willing to do that. Yeah, so a couple points I can point out that he mentioned He said that if you watch the first episode carefully, it has little pieces of the future of the season woven throughout the entire episode. Hmm. Which is why I went back and I watched it again for like the third time because I was trying to pick out some of those pieces. And I mean, aside from aside from like the radiation sign I think, and the the outfit the guy was wearing, I couldn't find it. I mean, they must be real subtle. Okay, so there is a really good article on Digital Spy. Uh, Fear the Walking Dead may have already crossed over oh, to the we're Walking gonna get there. Dead. We're going to get there. Okay, good. Because <laughs> oh. you're going to get there too, right, Tom? Uh, is this about a symbol that yes. we see? Yes, yes it is. Yeah, I, yeah well, I'll be honest I was watching this on the big screen with uh, my friend Tara and we're watching it. And all of a sudden she shrieked and I looked over and I had no idea what she was shrieking about. And then the episode ended and I'm like, what was that shriek for? And she's like, that symbol, that symbol that was on Rick's helicopter. I totally didn't catch it until I read the news preparing for this episode. I didn't either because it looks so much like the biohazard. That's uh, what I thought symbol. it was. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly what I thought it was. Yeah. And then I watched uh, Talking Dead and Chris Hard- uh, Chris Hardrick brings it up in his opening monologue. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that was that was one that I did not catch. She caught and bravo to her because uh, I totally missed that. But she shrieked the instant she saw it, so she <laughs> she knew. That's an amazing set of eyes. But uh, there's a couple other things that I had asked Michael about, and this was before I saw the Talking Dead, where they kind of showed what I asked him. But I was asking him if the the opening scene with the plane, if the actors were actually suspended and hanging, or if oh. it was just if it was just camera tricks, like they can turn the camera sideways or upside down and stuff like that. And he told me that Lenny, Maggie, and I'll read you exactly what he wrote. Lenny, Maggie, and Jenna were strapped in and hanging. We try to do everything as real as possible. And with actors like ours, it's amazing to see. The cockpit was so small to get the Walker, Jenna, Maggie, and camera in. Jenna and Maggie took turns holding each other's heads. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it must have been real small. Wow. You know, like, have you ever been in uh, like on a roller coaster or anything like that where you're strapped in and like they leave you at the top of a loop or something and you're sitting there and you're suspended and just the pressure on wherever you're being harnessed in from is a lot to take for those few moments on a roller coaster. I can't imagine having to do take after take after take being strapped into a ch- uh, chair. 
and the blood rushing to your head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Plus, how do you get them up in there? The 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 um, fuselage must they must have been able to rotate it at will. Because you can't I, just I, I like. I don't think I don't think so. Because when they showed it on, they showed it on Talking Dead. That it was a big, it was an actual airplane. I just, I'm wondering how you get Lenny James back into his seat and buckled in. Like, do three guys lift him up? Like, how does that work? <laughs> that, that's where they call the interns. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So uh, I also, I asked Michael about, I had to ask him a Walking Dead question, but I, I asked him about the Grove, and I asked him, I said, kids don't fare well in the Walking <laughs> Dead, but have been better in fear. Melissa is amazing, and her performance that episode was Emmy-worthy. Now, we know it's fictional, but does a heavy episode like that make it a lot harder to direct or is it emotionally draining as a director or is it just another day at work in which he replied the grove was particularly dark it does not change the way i shoot an episode but it was very important to keep it light for the two brilliant young actors i mm. had interesting i did i did spend a lot of time with brayton and kyla in prep to talk about how important they were to the story and about having a great time, even with the heavy material. Wow. Yeah. And then he told me he still, he keeps in touch. He still keeps in touch with Kyla and Brighton cause he loves them. Oh yeah. And he then works, he works well uh, with children. Well, yeah, he, it, that that Grove episode, I just could not imagine directing like that to me. I mean, I don't know. I don't have any kids or or family, but I could not imagine directing that episode. That episode was so heavy that it had to be rough. So yeah. thinking back to what they told us about when they filmed Scars and how they had psychologists on the set and i'm assuming they must have done the same thing for the grove oh yeah they did i, I know they i think uh i saw a panel with kyle and brighton and they mentioned they had say like, i think they i think they even had to go to the psychiatrist before they got the part to make sure that they'd be able to handle it that makes sense yeah I, Marnell and I were talking about it a little bit, and you know, just in terms of the liability of working with child actor, actors, it makes sense that they would want to have those pieces in place. Well, and I wonder if um, that is one of the reasons why they seem to cast siblings in the show, because um, the kid that plays Alex in this episode was also is the brother of uh, Major Dodson who played Sam. I think it mom. was it was Dylan. Mom. Mom. Yeah. Mom. Yeah. Mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dylan was the kid's name though. Yes. Dylan was the young kid. Yeah. Oh, okay. So Wrong the last kid. the the last thing I actually asked Michael, I wanted to give him something something a little lighthearted. So I, I told them to give me the first word that comes to mind when I mention certain actors. So I, I mentioned Jenna Elfman. His, his response was lion-hearted. Oh, that's Aww. awesome. Yeah. Okay, so mine would be Dharma. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it. I binge-watched the entire series of Dharma. Did you? Uh, Did you like it? Yeah, well, what happened was I had... Back in November, I had dinner with her in Rhode Island, and we're sitting there talking, and I, I told her, I said, I'll be honest, I knew you from Dharma, but I've never seen Dharma and Greg. So she laughed, and about maybe two months after that, I got a text message from her, Dharma and Greg is now on Hulu. So, <laughs> so I I signed up for Hulu and I binged it and I have never laughed so much in my life. I do not know how I missed this show when it was on. It was I a great show. show. Yeah. It it was hysterical. 
but uh, yeah, so I I actually watch it, and then at uh, what was it Walker Stalker Chicago, I dressed up as Greg, yes, and I did I did a photo op, and we recreated one of the I think it was one of the DVD covers. That so. was a really funny picture. I missed that one. You'll have oh, to I'll, post that one to the Biters page. All right, I'll post it. <laughs> <laughs> So now the next the next name I gave him was Denai Garcia, who plays. Oh, my God. Why do I always forget her character's name? Lucy. Lucy. Yeah, Lucia. Uh, and he's he responded, beautiful soul, mm. which she totally is. She's a complete sweetheart. Uh, then I did Alicia Debnam Carey and he put brilliant. Uh, Coleman Domingo. Commitment. Ooh, that's cool. Garrett Dillahunt. Now, this is the one that I wasn't sure if I should have asked a follow-up here, but Garrett Dillahunt, he put the truth. Huh. Now, now I'm assuming that means that he'll always tell you the truth. But Hmm. then I threw in, uh, oh, wait, Maggie Grace, which he said scrappy. (laughs) <laughs> which I can totally see. That really goes with Althea. That really goes with her character. And then I had to I had to throw in one from Walking Dead, so I said Melissa McBride. And he said selfless. Oh, nice. Yeah, so he I mean he's such a great guy and he took all this time, always answered any question I had. He's just I mean, he's just such a nice guy. So did you meet him at one of the cons? No, he's never been. He's never been to any. Huh? Yeah. I, when I went, when I went uh, to the premiere, I was kind of hoping he would be there, but he, uh, they, the cast that was at the premiere this weekend, they had uh, this screening. Then the next morning, they had to do some a couple other press things, and then they all flew back. To do shooting. They're, yeah, they're still filming. Uh, wow. Yeah, he's a busy guy. Yeah. And he's got both shows, too. Mm-hmm. Right? So he doesn't get any downtime. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know uh, how many episodes he has in Walking Dead, but they're filming now, too. So who knows if he gets a break. But he deserves one. And if you're yes. listening, Michael, thank you so much. Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you. Because, you know, I'm sure he listens to this <laughs> all the time. Hey, he might listen to this one. Yeah, I'll see what I can do. He's the one who posted as Alaska Girl and gave us the worst review. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure you want him to listen to oh this one? Oh, my gosh. I was actually, I'm like, okay, no, there are more positive reviews than there are this review. But <laughs> this person actually said the most basic podcast ever. These people have no idea what they're talking about. Oh, I was, I was like, gonna oh. ask: is is basic bad or good? <laughs> well, so the my favorite murderer gals spun that into a media empire. So there, <laughs> right? We just don't I, podcast about serial killers because they took my idea. <laughs> I mean, I'm old. I don't know if I don't know if basic is good or bad nowadays. I think we're both older than you. So we're super old. No, I know I'm older than you <laughs> are now. All right. Now I got to ask, how old are you? Oh, I'm not going to say that oh, on a on. podcast that people are going to listen to. I'm 48. I, I'm going to be 49 at the end of the year. Age I'm is old. only a number. <laughs> and Di and I are 10 years apart. I am 39. I will be 40 in December. That's great. <laughs> He's not hey. giving into pressure. <laughs> you know? So, who's got a good? The older oh, no, you wait. are, the longer you live. We have an actor highlight? Yeah, we have a featured cast. Actor and we've spot, got a little, yeah. little bit for Whisperer's Corner as well. So, Marnell, it's your turn to talk. You have to take us away and educate us about Matt Frewer. Oh, my goodness. So, my first reaction when I heard he was coming on the show was... Max Headroom, an icon of the 80s. So did and you know did you know he was Max Headroom from his name? Yes. 
Oh, because I had no idea. I didn't I... either, Tom, to be honest with you. I remember Max Headroom sort of, you know, I remember a few things, but I wasn't a huge fan. That's the age difference between me and Marnell. <laughs> So I love Mac. I love Matt Frewer. Uh, really quickly, he was actually born in Washington D.C. and raised in um, in Canada. And hockey is in his blood. He wanted his father uh, played hockey, not professionally, but he uh, Matt also played hockey in high school and planned to be a professional hockey player. But then he decided that um, he didn't want to. Uh, um, oh, he, and then he was going to go for uh, a degree in biology. And then he said he didn't want to spend his life dissecting worms in <laughs> Ontario, Canada. So he moved to England to try his hand at acting. And I guess he did a lot of Shakespeare and got really sick of it. Uh, and then he graduated, uh, from, oh, I lost it. I can't find it. I just like how he planned on being a professional hockey player. Yeah. <laughs> and I know, then he I decided he wanted to keep his teeth. <laughs> but, but never quite worked out. Well, he, uh, his dad did play some hockey, and he was apparently very good at it in high school, and it was Canada, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, I cannot find where he graduated now. That's going to drive me nuts. Uh, but he, one of his very first credits, and I can't believe you guys didn't... It, have you seen anything that he's been in? I've Either. only seen the the one HBO show. Wow, that just blows my mind. So one of the very first things that I know him from is uh, Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. Oh, right. So he was in that. But I honestly would not have remembered him. I mean, I've seen The Meaning of Life, but I would not have picked him out of that cast. And I think probably the only reason why I know that is because I really love Monty Python and it was so close to him premiering as Max Hedrum. And I can't believe Diane didn't know who Max Hedrum was because. Yes, I did. I mean, I didn't know that Travis or that uh, okay. Matt Frewer was Max Matt. Hedrum, but I knew okay. who Max Hedrum was. I'm okay, sorry. I'm like, I had the album by the Art of Noise. <laughs> okay. I was like, he was on Cyberpunk. Of course you had to know him. I don't even know what cyberpunk is. Uh, it was a television series way back in the day. Way uh, back in the day from the thirty back. from the thirty nine year old. <laughs> <laughs> hey, like I'm sure anybody under thirty, unless they've seen the movie Pixels, has no idea who Max Hedrum is. Um, so uh, he was also in Supergirl. Do you guys remember that? No. Nope. Nope. Wow. Did you even watch Supergirl, Tom? Nope. Okay. You're talking about that the I one get... with Helen Slater, right? Yes. Yeah, I vaguely remember it. God. Yeah, no, not me. I watch way too much TV. <laughs> um, so one of the more interesting things uh, that I read about him is he has uh, appeared in more TV film slash miniseries for Stephen King than any other actor. He has been in The Stand, Lawnmower Man 2, uh, Quicksilver Highway, Riding the Bullet, Desperation, and Bag of Bones. Okay, I have to say, I remember The Stand. I did see The Stand. I will admit that I saw The Stand. I remember okay. the character that he played because I loved that character from the book. Boom de boom he was the garbage man. The right? trash the can gar- man. Trash yeah. can man. Yep. Yeah. Boom de boom. Yeah. Um, so that, for me, that's one of his more uh, iconic roles that I, I remember him from. Uh, he was in, and I remember this series, and it was on sci fi, but I don't think that the channel was called sci fi back then. It may have been, but it was the different spelling. Uh, it's called Sci Factor Chronicles of the Paranormal. It was a TV series in the late 90s. God, I vaguely remember that. He also wrote and directed one episode for Sci Factor. So that was kind of a, a big thing for him. Um, Okay, so the Disney 
uh, Hercules movies, cartoons. Oh. He's Panic. Hmm. Nope. Nope. <laughs> uh, he is one of um, Hades' little minions. Uh, he and Bobcat Goldthwait. I think I'm saying that right. Yeah. Uh, were were the little minions for um, Hades. I can't believe you guys don't know this. Nope. You're not going to go down his entire list of three. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, oh okay. No. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, the other thing that I know him from is uh, he played a very quirky character in a TV show called Eureka, uh, which was very funny. If you're looking for something funny to binge, you can do that. And you watched uh, The Magicians, right? Because he was I in watched, that. Yes, I watched The Magicians. I watched Falling Skies. Um, the Witches of East End was on my list to watch, but it fell off somehow. Uh, the Librarians. Orphan Black. Orphan Black. I mean, I know him from so much television, m- movies and television, going back to the beginning of his career. So I'm I'm super excited now to have him on the show. I'm a little bit concerned because um, so IMDb, far. Oh, IMDb yeah. only has him listed for two episodes. Yes. What is up with that? I don't know if that's the type of thing they'll update as he's in them. I kind of think it has to be because he's only credited in this episode and then episode three. So I'm sure he's in episode two, right? I can't imagine that they would start this big, bad character and then only have a couple of episodes. Well, the thing we'll, we'll probably get to it later, but I'm pretty sure there's going to be a, a big flashback episode. Mm. Oh, okay. Because remember, oh, Daniel. Right. We we have no idea what happened to him on on the uh, the dam. Well, even Filthy Woman had half a half a, a season, so you would think that they're going to give Matt Ferrer more time than that. <laughs> right. So for those of you who don't know who Max Hedrum was, uh, I love this little snippet. Um, His backstory provided in the Max Hedrum character in his original appearance comes from a dystopian near future dominated by television and large corporations. That's That's, pretty much the time we're living in. I was just going to say that (laughs) sounds like today. Yep. Yep. You can see a lot of old funny clips on YouTube. Uh, if you've never heard of Max Headroom, uh, you should go at least watch the 25 funniest things Max, Max Headroom said on uh, YouTube. Well, and I think it's important to listen to the song Paranoia by uh, Art of Noise. So watch that <laughs> video, too. Um, so ironically enough, as he was an um, AI character... He has no social media. I Zero. Saw, I looked for him on on uh, Instagram and, and couldn't find him. No Instagram, no Facebook, no Twitter. Good for him. Nothing. Wow. <laughs> uh, he's married with one kid, so he's got the time. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he he is a, acting like nonstop. I so. do think it's important to say, since we are a zombie podcast, that he was in Dawn of the Dead in 2004. He was. And it's also important to say that he's got a little bit of crossover with Jeffrey Dean Morgan. We talked before we signed on about him being in the movie Watchmen. Yep. And he also has had some episodes of Supernatural. Oh, that's right. None of which I've seen. <laughs> So I watched Watchmen, but it was a long time ago, and I know I need to watch it again. Eh, it was okay. The graphic I'm... novel was iconic, so... Oh, yeah, I will give you that. Um, He's won a couple awards, and I think he was actually nominated for something for Supernatural. Um... Uh... Maybe a Super Emmy? (laughs) (laughs) No. 
uh, he won an ACE award for music host for Max Headroom because Max Headroom was a popular VJ on MTV. God, that, that I remember <laughs> way back. Um, he won a Gemini award for best performance in a children or youth program series for a series called Mentors. Um, I looked that up. It had a very large cast. Yeah. No, I could have sworn he had, there was something with Supernatural. He was nominated for some sort of award, but you know, I can't find it. Can't find anything tonight. Well, he has done a lot. He had 137 actor credits on IMDb. And that was like credits and he's been in multiple episodes. Like he's been in 11 episodes of Orphan Black. But I'm right there with you, Tom. I don't remember him very well at all, other than him being Max Headroom. So don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah, no, I I remember Max Headroom when I was he... very little. <laughs> <laughs> he was such a he's such a great character actor, uh, and just to, the the character he played in The Stand and also in Eureka, it just he picks these great quirky roles so it, to see him as a quote-unquote bad guy i'm gonna leave that there yeah. um uh, it's gonna be interesting um because even when he's played a bad guy it's been kind of a funny quirky bad guy and i don't think we're gonna get that from logan no he doesn't seem very funny or quirky he seems pretty hard at serious but he also doesn't seem like a bad guy. No. Exactly. We will get into that. <laughs> mm. That's true. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're just making, trying to make us think he's the next big bad. Yeah. He, I, cause not really? if he's only in two episodes. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, so that is Matt Frewer. Like I said, he doesn't have very much social media out there. So there's not a lot about him personally, but he has been a major character actor in a ton of movies and TV. And I highly encourage you to browse his IMDb and pick something because it's all good. I will try to remember to put up a link to that Art of Noise video. Oh, definitely. Because that was really memorable for me. So, well, just a brief trip into Whisperer's Corner. Um, not to get political because God knows the three of us don't to get need to get political <laughs> with each other. But AMC is actually looking at potentially pulling Walking Dead out of Georgia because of the heartbeat bill that's supposed to go into effect in Georgia in 2020. I love how Diane um, strategically didn't say pulling out of Georgia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can, can I can I say one thing about this? Absolutely. It's, I mean, we might let's is, just lay it on the table, man. No, I mean it's not even it's not even a political thing. It's a business thing. There is no way AMC is going to pay to build sets somewhere else. Or move people to another place when they're getting their tax breaks. They have their sets done. They have all this. There's no way AMC is going to do that. It's just an empty threat. And if you actually read what AMC said, they didn't even say we're going to pull out. They said if this bill is signed, we're going to look at our situation. I think they said. Right. I think the word that they used was reevaluate. Right. Yeah. They're not so, moving. So I have to agree with Thomas on this one. I don't think that they're going to follow through on their threat just because of, like you said, the tax breaks and all the movie sets and everything. Um, but I also agree that it is kind of about their image because if, you know, a, a big actor gets into trouble or something, you know, they usually get dropped from shows because people, you know, have a tendency to say they're going to stop watching and, you know, things like that. So it, it, I'm sure there's a lot of people who uh, praise AMC for at least putting them, uh, putting that out there. Um, can I, can but, I also add I'm not in favor of the bill. <laughs> I just want to make that perfectly clear. I'm not in favor of the bill. 
Well, and, well, and you guys know me. I don't hide my politics. I'm pretty liberal. But I would yeah. say that even if AMC stays in Georgia, I'm not going to stop watching The Walking Dead. I'm exactly. just not. Yeah. Exactly. I'm going to be totally honest about that. And the other thing is, is I really, I think about Georgia and I think about places like Sonoy and how hard hit they would be if Walking Dead pulled out. And I've got pretty mixed feelings because, you know, I don't want to see places like that suffer. Right. And uh, aside from the fact TV is somewhere you go to get away from, this is fiction. Mm -hmm. This is where you go to get away from politics. You go to get away from everything. Amen. So. And, and this is the other thing that I kind of want to say, and this this is a little political, but when you think about the economic impact that something like, like a withdrawal from Georgia would create, so the state's film industry, according to the article that I looked at, supports 92,000 jobs and was responsible for $2.7 billion in direct spending in Georgia last year. Wow. So there would be huge economic repercussions if oh, I think I think Georgia's past Hollywood as th- a filming site. I think you're right. I mean, I know that they have that big studio that that most of the Marvel movies was filmed at and that Walking Dead used for their soundstage last year for episode 15. You know, and that just goes to show you how big tax credits fare into where people film, because Alaska has very good tax credits. And if you've noticed, there are a ton of reality TV series set in Alaska. (sighs) Don't even get started (laughs) on the reality TV thing. Nobody wants to go to Alaska. <laughs> That's you can the try and try and try. Alaska. You're never going to get it to work, Margo. <laughs> oh, trust me. I love that we're so isolated. You can only get to my place by boat or plane. Yeah. I'm safe in the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> but you're broke when you have to fly out for family emergencies. <laughs> right? Thank goodness for Miles. Well, make sure a journalist isn't flying your plane. <laughs> <laughs> so that was our very brief political foray on Whisperer's Corner. Um, so another thing, this episode's got got a terrible review by Forbes. I almost always look at the Forbes reviews. I know. Um But, you know, some of the stuff that the reviewer griped about, so he griped about the coincidence of Salazar being one of Althea's interviews, and I was actually really okay with that. Yeah. And then the person who wrote the review also had an awful lot of opinions about what nurses, quote, do. Okay. (laughs) Which I had some pretty strong feelings about uh, the reviewer and basically thought he was an idiot. And he was also hating on Al and hating on the new showrunners. So I really think that this reviewer was trash. (laughs) Yeah, I never, never listen to reviewers because they always have their agendas. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy, guy or girl, I don't know who it was, could have reviewed Game of Thrones and... And there's a dragon carrying bodies away and fire, like spitting fire. I mean, who cares? It's a show. Right. If you don't like it, I mean, I don't know. I just get fed up with people that are with with professional reviewers. Well, this is a pretty harsh review. And although this was probably not my favorite ever episode of Fear, I was like, "Mm, this guy needs to take a hike. So the other thing, and this is probably more of a rotting potpourri thing, and we kind of touched on it, but the the symbol and CRM and what that means, that was big in the news. So we'll have to talk about that more. The only other thing I wanted to say in Whisperer's Corner, and then we can move on to goods, bads, and uglies, is that Pollyanna McIntosh's movie Darlin, which is a sequel to the movie that you watched, Marnell the Woman... Mm-hmm. premieres on July 12th and EW online has a trailer. If people are interested in looking at that, <sighs> I'm yep. going to have to watch it now just out of morbid <laughs> curiosity. It's it's actually going to be in select theaters and all, and also all the video on demand places. Oh, good for her because she wrote and directed. So good for Pollyanna McIntosh. Yes, Absolutely. 
Um, we talked a little bit before the show that, um, of course, we had talked about Whiskey Cavalier being canceled last episode. And um, I didn't know that Michael Cutlass's, uh show, The Kids Are All Right, was also cut. Yep. That one makes that one makes me sad. Yeah, we talked about that, and that's disappointing because it, it reviews aside and prof- opinions about professional reviewers aside, it did get a lot of great feedback and a lot of great reviews. So I was really shocked to hear that. Well, and it was I think it was a mid season replacement that got picked up for twenty two episodes, and it was a ratings bust or a boom, and then it busted for a while. But it was on its way back up when they decided to cut it. So, I, did you, I think. Did you happen to see who was in? I think it was the last episode. I didn't. <laughs> Josh McDermott. Oh. Oh, that's right. I saw them post on Twitter. Yeah. That was yeah. I'm not sure um, if it was the last episode or the second to last, but one of them. So it it wouldn't shock me if there. I haven't seen much of a rallying cry for it, but. You know, Netflix is always picking up series that people want to bring back, and the ratings were on its way, their way up. So, yeah, I I just love Michael Cutlass, and I want him to do good. Well, we will see him back in season ten, directing an episode of Walking Dead. He just did last week. Very cool. Yep. He did a great job with the episode that he directed in season nine. So I'm looking forward to it. And Coleman Domingo directs episode three of Fear this year. Right. I saw that. So they're kind of doing the thing that, well, I guess they're not quite as bad as Game of Thrones was doing this season, but they don't have episode titles yet. They just had the episode title for the next episode and nothing beyond that, which I think is kind of a new thing for Walking Dead and Fear the Walking Dead. I feel like we usually know months ahead of time. I like it better if you don't know it. Just because some of the, some of the titles give it away. Exactly. Coda. Yes, that I, is exactly I knew, what I thought of. I knew what was going to happen in Coda. Because Ugh. it's the end of a piece of music. Ugh. Yeah. So sad. But yes, I, I agree. And a lot of people got frustrated at uh, Game of Thrones this season for doing that. They got frustrated at Game of Thrones for a lot of things. But I I kind of like that. I I don't like the, the giveaway. Um, yeah, you can definitely see the titles of last season's Walking Dead and, you know, can pr- predict the episode. So I'm OK with it. Well, anything else for Whisperer's Corner? That's all I've got. Nothing from me. All right. Tom, you want to hit us with your good? All right. Um, My good is actually pretty generic. Uh, It was the acting. I think this is one of the best ensemble casts of actors that I've seen in a TV show. I mean, specifically in this episode... I loved Denai Garcia. I thought she was amazing. I thought she did a really good job, too. That's one of the things that I had in my notes. Mm-hmm. And even uh, the one that really impressed me, I mean, Jenna and Garrett, they're always amazing. But that new young girl, the driver of the truck. Oh, I, I don't uh, know. I don't know her name. Her, her name was Annie on the show, and her name in real life is Bailey Guvalik. G A V U L I C. G-A-V-U-L-I-C. Hmm. Well, I thought she was fantastic. I don't know how old she is or whatnot, but I thought. I mean, the acting. The acting on this show has been so spot on. I mean, since since season four. So just, she doesn't have a date of birth on her IMDb profile. So I couldn't tell you how old she is. Well, that's right. Cause I'm not going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was my good. I just think the acting in this episode, I mean, specifically deny and this younger girl uh, was just so incredible when deny, I mean, I, and <laughs> 
Jen and I were giving like hand signs during during the panel after the show because she was asking me how I liked because people were asking questions and they were answering, but she was sitting like five feet in front of me. So she would look at me and she would like motion. What do you think of the episode? And I kept telling her I was nervous because mm. I really thought I really thought that I was going to die. That's in my writing potpourri, but I'll say it now. I'm not entirely convinced that was a survivable wound, but uh, yeah. <laughs> And one of my things is, like, in the apocalypse, there's going to be things that definitely kill a ton of people. And that's, like, thirst, starvation, uh, extreme temperatures, and infection. Infection. Nobody's getting an infection from the cuts on their hands or the impalements or anything. Well, she's not out of the woods. I mean, even June said that she was going to potentially have nerve damage. That's true. Well, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that they'll go back and do anything more with it, but she's not out of the woods. I was gonna say I don't. I mean, they they did show uh, Nick suffering from infection really badly, but and nearly dying, but nobody ever seems to die of it. Well, and if you I go, can't... you go back to The Walking Dead. T Dog had the really bad oh, infection. Oh right, yeah. season two. I just can't see them killing her off via infection, though. Well, Tom, I, know, I, I I just thought she was going to die from that wound. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause, and just, I don't know, there was just something in my gut was telling me. I was nervous when, when I saw that. And she acted it very well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, so I kind of combed through my memories of season four, and I agree with you, Tom. I thought they were a really cohesive unit, and I feel like the relationships have just continued to develop. So I'm looking forward to where we go with that. Yeah, you know, and they all have their own personalities mm-hmm, too. Yeah. That's 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 the amazing part that they mesh. Like when you get a you get a group in a show like if like Friends or Cheers or Seinfeld, when those actors can can work together so well, it just makes the show that much better. Mm-hmm. You know, and I I don't have a complaint about any of our main cast. Uh, like we we go through the uh, the seasons and we're like, ugh, Lori or ugh, Madison. There's nobody I have any qualms with. I love all our whole cast of characters. Yes, I actually care about all these characters. <laughs> you know, and I think that's something that Marnell and I have said when we've been talking about fear since the reboot in season four is that they finally mm-hmm. made me care. Yep. Yep. Cause that's, that's what I was saying. That's what we were saying before they, they reboot. I was like, you could kill everyone off and reboot it with an entire new cast and try again. And that's pretty much what they did. Yeah. I mean, midway through season three, I think it started to get really a lot better, mm-hmm. but but four just cemented it when they added Jenna and Garrett and uh, Maggie and everybody, basically everybody. Yeah, Daryl Mitchell and Mo Collins. Yeah, really yeah. good. Alexa Nissenson. Nissenson. Yeah, I I think I mispronounced it, but all of them work great together. Mm-hmm. So that. That that was my good. So, Marn, what was yours? Uh, my good was my good usually, which is Alicia. I am still in love with this character. I I feel like other than her being an uber badass, this would be me in the zombie apocalypse <laughs> because the whole scene that she had with um, did you just compare yourself to alicia I in the think apocalypse I, did. I said other than being a badass i totally relate to her uh talk with morgan where she's like why are we helping people anymore and i was thinking that through the entire episode i was like everybody's either missing or dead or doesn't want help you crashed Nobody wants your help. These kids don't want your help. You're all risking your lives and your health. You know, uh, um, Luciana's been impaled. Uh, Alicia's, you know, her hand is damaged. And we just keep going with trying to help people. And I'm kind of over it. And so I get where she's coming from this entire episode. And plus, I love the the smart 
things that she does do. Um, the, Using the propeller. I was just the thinking trip, that. Yeah. No, no, no. The trip line. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like the walkers are knocked down before they get to you. I, that is such a simple thing that I never had thought of. And as soon as she did it, I was like, of course, why wouldn't you do that? I love it. It's amazing. I, I love Alicia's character and I completely identify with her every single episode. So she's always my good. <laughs> when, whenever, whenever I see Alicia on TV, I think to myself, that's Marnell. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, about the only thing her and I have in common is we're both brunette. <laughs> so what's your good, Diane? So my good was June, and specifically June as a nurse. I finally believed it this time. So as someone who has worked in the emergency room and who's worked in various hospital settings as a nurse, I appreciated that she was so cool when she was assessing the initial trauma, when she was assessing Lucy's uh, penetrating injury. I appreciate that she had the intelligence to not remove the impaling object, but to actually saw it off and transport the patient with the object. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated how commanding she was when she set up the scene to remove it. Right down to barking at Alicia. Alicia, no, now. So yeah. I just, I thought that Very I finally believed nurse. that character as a nurse and as a trauma nurse. And I really appreciated Jenna Elfman's portrayal of it. So we had talked about this before with the Forbes article where the guy said, it's just unbelievable that she would be performing surgery and blah, blah, blah. Okay, Herschel was a veterinarian, and you <laughs> yeah. had no problems with him removing a bullet from Carl's stomach. So six, six fragments. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that that uh, June could have removed the impalement and stopped the bleeding. Well, and well, I don't know if you guys have ever worked with a good trauma nurse, but a good trauma nurse is worth her weight in gold. Well, I wonder, I wonder what this reviewer thought when Herschel lost his leg. <laughs> It was entirely appropriate for Rick to chop it off. Come on, he was a sheriff's deputy. <laughs> and again, a little bit, of, a little bit of gauze, and it just heals right up. Right. Who was our quote-unquote doctor when Carl got shot in the eye, too? Right. But she actually had medical school training, right? But she wasn't a surgeon. She was not a surgeon. I agree. Yeah, so I just, I keep going back to that Forbes article, and I'm like, no, you're wrong. You're wrong on everything. You're just wrong. Mm. And he was wrong on the nurse thing, because <laughs> nurses kick ass. That's why I don't read Forbes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Thomas, what was your bad? All right. I know we're all, we, we all might have the same bad, I think. Um. I really like the episode, so like I said, I'm nitpicking here. But these kids, <laughs> the, 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 the very beginning of the episode, okay, the, the one kid shoots the, shoots the deer, but then the walkers appear and the brothers gun jams. Mm -hmm. Now, these kids have survived how long in this apocalypse? And he had no clue what he was gonna do because that gun was jammed. He didn't. Uh, he didn't try and hit the walker in the head. With he didn't. He just looked so flustered. I don't think there's any way this these kids would have survived this long. And then two minutes later, he pulls the same gun up to shoot, and he yes. realizes it's jammed again. Sure. Oh time, my god! I totally missed that. Un, oh. Time does unjam it. Yeah. I exactly when when he pulled the gun up again, I'm like, what are you doing? Did we did you clear it while we weren't watching? Right. You yeah. just you just saw it was jammed. It doesn't unjam itself. <laughs> you know, I didn't write that down, but that was really good. The thought did cross my mind while he was kind of struggling with the the jammed gun and, and being frazzled and kind of not knowing how to respond. Right. Come on, really? You're not going to just Cause... put that down and stab the walker in the head? Right, it's been so long, and these kids obviously have survived. They must know something, but he well, looked so frazzled. Now, how long have they survived without their parents? Because, I mean, their parents could have died like eight days ago. 
you know? I got True. the feeling that it's been a lot longer than that. They looked pretty scruffy. Yeah. Yeah, you would think my bad would be the kids. But your I bad, like your bad is always the kids. <laughs> I, I actually I liked Annie. I will have to say I I really liked Annie. So um I actually in fact I wrote Annie is kind of smart. No, I mean I like the characters. I just think they there's a, been a couple, those couple little nitpicky things. So my bad was actually also very nitpicky. Um, the fact that we had conveniently had hacksaws in our box. <laughs> uh, oh. and, yeah, and that uh, we found a plane that still had Avgas that'll fire um just there was a lot of really convenient things that i'm just you have to suspend your disbelief i know but i think with the gas thing yeah we have to because they've been finding gas on these shows for years and they shouldn't i'm just i'm it was there a hacksaw in every box or was there like one box and you happen to find it in all the wreckage and zombies and fire and I just, I, there was a lot of things. That's really the only two things that I wrote down. But there was a lot of things this episode that was just, it's, you know, it's the little things that take you out of the moment. So, um, right. I was, like, like Althea grabbing her video camera to <sighs> videotape while the walkers are coming out. That part, that part, that yes. got me. Yeah. That took me out. Again, yes. I'm nitpicking, but I mean, and, come on, videotape later. You don't have to grab it while the walkers <laughs> are attacking you. Right? Yeah. So my my stuff was was the very nitpicky things of the episode. It it wasn't anything overall bad. Um, I, in spite of my four point two five, I really did like the episode. There were just a few things, and of course, the kids. Well. So, Di, what was your bad? Buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> so You had the lowest rating of all, so... My bad, which is also my I'm not in love with moments, was a fairly lengthy list. So there were a lot of moments that I really struggled with. Um, I was not in love with the big new bad the setup of of landon landon no logan as being logan. our big new bad because it's not really feeling very novel at this point so now based on what we were talking about i'm really actually hoping that they're not setting him up as our bad guy i think tom and i are gonna talk you out of that okay you're gonna have to try okay. so, i mean i i personally i don't see him as a bad guy he owns the building. He's just yeah. going back to his building. He and he knew the combination to the lock. I mean, he, he just wanted it, his stuff. He well, set so it up where no, no one was going to get hurt. That's what I'm saying. I'm actually really hoping that they're not setting him up to be our big bad because I feel like we've kind of been there, done that. Yeah. You know, we've had the, the big bad guy like... The filthy woman, like the governor in the main series, we don't need that again. Yeah, I don't yeah. think I don't think that he's going to be the big bad. I think the big bad has to do with whoever tasered Althea at the yeah. end. Yeah. So another thing that I really struggled with was that it took the rewatch for me to really feel oriented with everything that was going on. I felt like it was really frenetic and kind of disconnected. So I, I really struggled with that. And again, part of it may have been the frame of mind that I was in when I first tried to watch it, but it just, I was confused. There was a lot of stuff I, where I was like, what, what, wait, what's going on? I, I blame the Alaskan air. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, when we come upon, or when the, when the plane crash lands, I'm like, where did we get a plane? Last we left off, like we were having trouble keeping track of the vehicles. Well, and so that's my next bad was that okay. never mind the gas. I'm not in love with the plane. I'm not well, in love with gone. the whole plane. <laughs> yeah, but there's another plane out there somewhere, right? Right. And apparently well, Coleman Domingo and um, 
what's his name? Uh, Ruben Blades can pilot it. Salazar. Yeah. Skidmark. Skidmark. Now I don't know if they're gonna they're gonna have like a an episode with a flashback of where they got the plane and all that, but I wouldn't be surprised because it was a little weird to just have a plane at the beginning of the season to kind of plummet into the middle of it. Yeah, they're gonna. I think they're they're gonna have to show where that came from. So yeah. my, my last thing on my bad list, my I'm not in love with moments, was that I'm not in love with Morgan's pep talk at the end. I mean, okay, I usually and... really like Lane James, and I usually really like where we're going with the Morgan character, but I was like, ugh, another pep talk? <laughs> See, you're on my girl Alicia's side. All I know is Alicia was covered in blood. What did you want Lenny to say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a bit too optimistic sometimes. Well, this is the two sides of him. Yes. It's either extreme optimism or extreme hate. Right. That like, I'm done true. with everything. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really have a middle ground. True. So that was my list of I'm not in love with moments. That's funny. We all had kind of minor things speckled throughout the episode. None of us ever had uh, we hate this one thing. Yeah, I wouldn't go so far as to say that I hated anything. I just wasn't in love with a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom, right. what was your ugly? My, well, I'm afraid to hear your ugly. If we heard your bad, um, my ugly was a good ugly. It was the, I mean, I don't think you'll agree with me, but the opening scene when the plane crashes, that entire, uh, I don't know if it's a set or soundstage or outdoor area, the entire cinematography of, of the people inside the, the plane, um, seeing the walkers coming and there was fire. Every, I mean, I just loved the look. Yeah. I mean, I was really disoriented and I think part of it too, and this may just be like my spatial processing stuff, but I had a hard time envisioning the plane and then envisioning all of the stuff that was going on actually being inside of that space. It just didn't seem like it fit, although it must have because it was a practical effect. Yeah, yeah, they were actually strapped in there. So. Yeah, so I think it just is my visual processing and my understanding of of spatial things, and I think I just had a hard time kind of processing the way it all fit together. And I loved I loved Alicia running around with the propeller, mm -hmm. just slamming people with it. I did I mean, like that. I I love that too. She she like came out of the smoke and had this propeller and yeah was wielding it like a professional. But I loved it when June woke up to the uh, yes! the one walker. Like, I was going to say face. that too. That was a small moment, but I really liked that when it was just kind of like oh terrifying wrapping its hand around her head. <laughs> oh, yeah, she actually she actually mentioned in I think it was in the panel. Where she think she stepped on the guy, she stepped on the walkers. Oh, they had it oh no! When they, when they weren't filming. Oh, I can see that happening because that really was. It was filmed in a cockpit, and there was like five people in that cockpit. Yep, tight quarters. Oh yeah, that that was my ugly. My I loved the entire cinematography, and it, the fact that it was the opening scene was just. It set it set the tone for the whole episode. Hmm. In my in my opinion, like I said, I I had a little bit confusion because of where we left off. That all of a sudden we have a plane that's crashing. But other than that, I'm like, sure. <laughs> well, they kind of answer that later on when when uh, Morgan was telling the girl, "We've been doing this for a while and we haven't had much luck." So you know that there was a time jump. Yes. We, we just don't know how far the time jump is. I think yeah. the, the showrunners said it was like a couple of months. I think they covered that on Talking. So, maybe we'll see where they got the plane. Maybe we won't. Who knows? 
Okay, so my ugly is a mixed ugly. Um, I'm not even going to say it's good or bad. Your ugly so, is always you, you a mixed always, ugly. You always, <laughs> you always do that. No, I don't. Yes, yes you, do. you do. Sometimes my ugly is a good ugly. Like, <laughs> just plain old good ugly. 75% of the time, you're always on the fence. Okay, Service. I would say 75%. <laughs> so here's my thing. I... The one of the things that's driving the story forward is something that is driving me absolutely insane in all practicality. I can't stand Al's drive for her story. She's always got to film. She's always got to go off on her own and do something and get in trouble. She's always like, uh, you know, on to the next story. And it's I, I get that it's taking us somewhere, but it just it. It grates on me sometimes. This sounds like a bad ugly. But it's a good ugly because of where it's going. You know, we're moving the the story forward and we're possibly moving it into Walking Dead Prime Universe. So I kind of like that. But I just, I don't know. Maybe it was because I was very, very annoyed with her going off on her own at night without telling anybody and then getting herself captured. I'm just I'm kind of sick of that happening to people it's like you know tell someone bring someone along you know like write a note because you know they're gonna go out looking for you that's what happened to Bob yeah and look at how that turned out for him exactly so you know I can't really say that it's all bad because it is driving the story forward and I kind of like where it's going so I will calm my myself for a little while on on the gratingness of that storyline i mean i don't mind i don't mind that she's filming and doing all this because that's what she does that's how she goes about her life i think that's what keeps her going i don't think she should be doing it in the middle of a battle with walkers i i just everybody is is doing stuff that's kind of dumb for their own survival and i it, it drove me nuts with morgan and his we have to help people and it's driving me nuts with owls i have to get the story so i'm on alicia's side where i'm like we need to just survive by ourselves like in, in our little group and where you know? is she gonna where is she gonna post these vlogs <laughs> <laughs> right this is not the mira grant universe right <laughs> which if you haven't read those books tom they're really fun <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no Twitter, there's no Facebook. Come on, right? Yeah, so it that it's just it's kind of grating on me. But like I said, I love where it's going, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that probably in Rotting Potpourri. So, Di, what was your ugly? Well, contrary to Tom's belief, my ugly was a good ugly. Oh, wow. And I actually really loved the zombie visuals in this episode. So I loved the Zeds being strung together by their guts. I thought that was great. I love the zombie heads. And then the scene shortly thereafter where the zombies are crossing the road and the SWAT van and the semi come rolling through. I don't know why I like that, but I just really like that a lot. The splat. Yeah. And the head, the head going flying. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, the zombie visuals in this episode, I really enjoyed. Yeah, and they were definitely put there for our enjoyment. I I loved the ones in the trees chattering their teeth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it, and the ones strung together by their entrails, it got me thinking. I'm like, how in the world could you possibly get a zombie? to stand still long enough for you to take out their entrails and tie them all together like that. Okay, and that's a good d- point, but I like it nonetheless. <laughs> oh, no, no. And how do you how do you get them up in the trees like basically just tied in by their hair without having that head that's still animated bite you? Mm. But the dudes in the suits. Those are pretty heavy duty suits. Oh, good point. Yeah, so it it really got me thinking. At first I was like uh, I, I was kind of annoyed in, okay, it's like they're just goring it up for us. But then I'm like, no, 
the only ones that could accomplish that are the guys in the suits. Why are they doing that? Inquiring minds want to know. I think we'll get an answer. I, I think you'll find out, yeah. So I agree with your good ugly. Well, onward to rotting potpourri. Okay, so did you guys actually watch, did you read the Digital Spy uh, um, article that we had talked about earlier? So I did I, not read I the, did not. I didn't read the Digital Spy one. I read another one. I can't remember who it was from, but lay it on us. Okay, so it, specifically in the Digital Spy, they link to a... Um, short video clip that somebody posted on Twitter and it is the scene where Jadis is radioing the helicopter that's coming to pick her and Rick up. Oh yes and there's speculation about who's on the radio. Yes so if you listen closely to the garbled radio it really really sounds like Morgan and Alicia. Really really. So I When? So, and it fits with it, it can fit with the timeline because we are in the past right now. So, they uh, Fear the Walking Dead is supposed to take another time jump at some point. So, they could be putting our Fear the Walking Dead cast in the Walking Dead Prime and crossing over to the Rick movies. So, Tom, what they're saying is that in. The episode where Rick is spirited off in the helicopter when Jadis is talking right. with the people in the helicopter before they land, they're saying that the voices that she's talking with, the, the article speculates that it could be Alicia, Morgan, and Dwight on the radio mm -hmm. with Jadis. Huh. Yeah. I didn't go, I didn't watch the, the link. I didn't watch it to, to listen to the voices, but I, I saw that. The reason that I linked to that article, the Digital Spy article, was they were also talking about the interlinked circles being the symbol that was on the helicopter that picked Rick up. Same mm -hmm. symbols as we see on the paperwork that Al finds. Right. Same it, on the signs. And then it has something to do with this group called CRM. Is that it? Is it yeah. DRM or CRM? It's DRM. DRM. Yeah. Huh. So, so there's a lot of speculation about who that may be. Uh, contamination well, something management? Contamination, contaminant resource management? Something. Contamination and radiation management? There we go. I have no guess. <laughs> But so uh, props to your friend who saw it while you and she were at the premiere. Yeah, it is the symbol that was on the helicopter. When you go back and look at pictures of the helicopter, it's pretty clear. But I thought it just looked like a radiation symbol. So. Me too. But it's actually three full interlocking circles, whereas the radiation symbol. Yeah, I, I knew it wasn't. Open. I knew it wasn't radiation symbol because I I'm a radiology tech. So oh right, <laughs> I see that every day. Good point. That's funny. So I I highly encourage people to go to the Digital Spy article and um, watch the little clip on Twitter that someone named at Brandon Davis BD posted. Brandon Davis. Oh, that, he's uh, from comicbook.com. Ah, oh, okay. okay. So what else you guys got? Uh, I don't I have, have a whole lot. We talked, yeah, we already talked about uh, Major Dodson's brother. Mm-hmm. Right. I loved that kid, by the way. I thought he was really cute, and I thought he did a good job. Oh, this one, not not Major? Not Major. I, I, I have to say I like Major's brother better, better than I liked Major. But Major was just a creepy little kid. Yeah, we were all hoping for Major to die. <laughs> mom, 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 yeah. mom. Yeah. I wouldn't mind yeah. seeing Dylan again. And I think, do you, so do you think we're going to see the kids again? I think we are. Oh, Def absolutely. Yeah, definitely. It's at least, I know at least you'll see the girl. Because I remember uh, before the episode aired, I think it was on Jenna's Instagram, she put a picture of her and said, 
this or no, maybe it wasn't Jenna. One of one of the cast put a picture of the girl on the Instagram and said, "This is her debut tonight." Oh, very cool. So, yeah, there's a there's a few new cast members that are going to be coming. Right. There's uh, what is her name? Karen Davis. Karen Karen David. I Karen think. David. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And we didn't even see Austin Emilio in this one. Right. And we didn't we didn't even talk about Salazar being on the video at the end, which is huge. Since Strand, I think Strand shot him in the face mm-hmm. the last time they saw each other. They were on the dam, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And the dam blew up. Mark my words. I think I think there's going to be a bottle episode with just Daniel in it, showing showing what he's gone through. That makes yeah. sense. Well, and how Alicia encountered him because we saw that with her tape, Madison tape. Um. Right. What do you mean? Wait, with with who? Um, uh, Alicia had oh, a tape Al, of Madison. Althea. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, Althea. How Althea had a tape of Madison. We saw an entire episode of their interaction. Right. So yeah. Think, there, there's got to be. There's got to be a flashback episode with Reuben Blades. Yeah. I love him. I think he's a great actor, so I'm not sorry to see him come back. I actually kind of like that they keep bringing him back from the dead, basically. Well, there's also, they announced, was it Daniel Sharman? The one, the, the, the brother that Madison hit in the head with the hammer. Oh, I heard something about that. And he That's was Troy. coming back. Troy. Yeah, he was yeah. coming back. Oh, interesting. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that's like a dream sequence or something. He was a pretty, I mean, not the actor, not reality, but he was a pretty awful character. Troy was a horrible human. He hmm. was. From beginning to end. Mm-hmm. So we'll have to see. We've, we're only one episode in. 15 more to go. Right. And... I mean, as much as I may not have rated this episode highly, there was a lot to talk about. Yeah, and the cliffhanger ending. Mm-hmm. So, April, uh, no, well, it was updated in April. Fear the Walking Dead showrunner denies shock return of major character in season five. And it, uh, it's all about Troy. So, they're denying he's coming back. Well, I hope that's accurate. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of hard. Well, I guess, I mean, the one guy got the spoon through the eye. And he was <laughs> he was up walking a couple days later, so I don't know. I guess maybe a hammer to the head, you could survive. That was him, wasn't it? It was the same character. Wait, it was, wait, was yeah. it the same guy? I'm pretty sure it was all, that, that Troy was also the one who got the spoon to his eye. Oh, yes, oh. he was. Maybe he oh, just yeah, has an he impenetrable must've... skull. He must have survived it then. <laughs> yeah, because we commented that he had the slightest bit of a black eye yes. like the next day. Yeah. Yeah, and no no vision damage. Yeah. I don't even think his eye was bloodshot. Didn't Madison do that too? Yep. It, yeah. Man, to get away. That was a while ago. He kind of had a weird crush on her mm-hmm. and she kind of took advantage of it and got close to him. Yeah. Creepy. He was a creepy character. He was. <laughs> well, well, we shall see. So I'm expecting you... Dwight next episode. I'm looking forward to seeing Austin Emilio. I really like him, too. I do, too. And, and I uh, hope we get some Sherry backstory. Yes. I was just going to say, I've, I've, I'm okay with however they tie that up. I would just like to see it tied up. Whether he never found her, uh, he found her and she was a walker, or he found her and she didn't want to be found, or they're together. Like, any way it plays out, I'm good. I just want to know that it played out. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure they'll have to at some point. They'll have to tie it up. Yeah. So did you guys notice that our kids had a new name for the walkers? Growlers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
But there was a moment where um, the youngest boy, Dylan Cooper Dodson, called when Lenny James was hanging uh, from the airplane and he starts to move and he's like, hold on, he's not a biter. He oh, said did biter. he say that? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, think did. I don't know I, if it was a slip or what. No, nah, they probably use different names. Yeah. I have to say that I I'm okay. I'm I don't like kids. You guys know I don't like kids. Uh, and the two boys to me are dead weight. But I liked Annie. She... <laughs> the dead weight. <laughs> <laughs> she really doesn't like kids. The one kid at least shot the deer. You got some. Food. <laughs> but do we have a deer? No. But, you know, Annie, she, I like, what is she probably 12, 13, maybe at her portrayal? I don't know the actress in real life, but she's driving this van and she is given our group the what for about helping people that you don't even know. And we don't. Hey, you guys, I made a terrible mistake and somehow managed to cut off our Skype call. So, we are restarting where Marnell was talking about liking Annie so much, and I'm sorry I don't have anything other than that. <laughs> I think that was just about finishing off the episode. Um, that I I loved Annie's character because she's she's so practical and she's a survivor. She's the next Alicia or the next Charlie. And you were and- talking about how she was giving our group what for about um, picking up and helping strangers and. Yeah, and just, like, all the dumb stuff that they do that is bad for their own survival. Like, I, oh, so... All the dumb stuff helping <laughs> everyone. Like, helping these three kids out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> well... Yeah, actually, yeah, our people saved those kids, so... Yeah, kind of. We don't know if the kids would have not been okay. Oh, uh, my God. If we weren't there, that one kid would have still been trying to <laughs> use, use the... <laughs> yeah, he still would have been shocked that his gun was jammed. I don't know. He could have ran. They could have ran. It seemed like Annie got there fairly quickly. So she was in the area just in time to, to hit the walkers with the, the van. So I have to say one of the other things that that I didn't love was Annie's character being like, it's so horrible here. You have no idea where you landed. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. But oh, she is trapped. They are trapped there. Why are They're... they trapped there, though? They've got a van. The, They're driving. The roads are, the roads are washed out okay. to the east and the south, I think. And they keep seeing the like the signs saying basically do not pass radiation, blah, blah, blah. And those roadblocks that somebody made with walkers tied together. So, you know, I mean, like they're like preteens stuck in the apocalypse. They probably just watched their parents get killed. And now they have to brave through all of this other crap like they're trapped, you know, they're totally so, setting us up to have radioactive radioactive zombies. Well, oh, sure. So the synopsis for the next episode: Morgan and Alicia meet survivor, a survivor, and learn of a grave new Walker threat. The mission mm. is put to the test when one of their own goes missing. Strand makes contact. So yeah, we probably are going to see a Maybe. crazy new Might- Walker. Maybe it'll be a two-headed walker. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be a unicorn walker. The toxic Avenger walker. Well, of course, on uh, the Walking Dead Our World game, they did introduce, quote-unquote, rotters a couple weeks ago, about a month ago, uh, into the game, which are a different type of zombie in the game. And... I don't know if they consider them swamp zombies or radio radioactive eaten zombies. I don't know. They kind of do look like the guys from the show Chernobyl. I just remember rotters as being a term that the governor used. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the was it the governor, the the people in the hospital? Oh, may I? For some reason, I think it was the governor, but maybe. 
Maybe it was the group in the hospital. Yeah, I, th- I think it was the I think it was the cops and Dawn in uh. the, the hospital too. See, instead of a show called Biters, we could have been a show called Rotters <laughs> or Growlers. Right, Growlers. I'm good with Biters. It works for that, me. That's my beer podcast. Growlers. growlers. <laughs> <laughs> So I did want to say that I thought there were there were some things that really made me think about the kind of nods to the Prime series. So the kids made me think of Jocelyn's kids. Um, I wrote myself a list here. Well, well, the the walkers that were tied to each other, creating the the roadblock, reminded me of the the ones that the saviors set up. Where mm-hmm. they they took one of Michonne's hair strands and put it in one. Oh right. Um, I love the callback to the brewing, and I loved Sarah talking to Jimbo. Dead silence. I didn't cut you guys yeah, off oh, again, no, did I? No, you didn't. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Still here. You didn't hang up. I loved that uh, her her attempt at bearing brew bearing brewing beer didn't turn out well. It tasted like kind of vinegary. Cause that's yeah. legit. Like you don't ever get your first like dozen batches quite right. So that's yes, makes... only, how long does it take to make a beer? It's only been a couple months. Mm, I think it depends on what kind of beer. And I think it depends on how you're doing it. Like, I remember that my husband brewed beer from some of the kits that were available several years ago, and it didn't take very long. Yeah. We have a whole bunch of small microbreweries in southeast Alaska. So, uh, and they, they, of course, literally got their starts from home brewing kits and, you know, brewing in their spare bedroom. I think they probably have those microbrewery things in New York too. Yeah, they have. <laughs> they, they, they they have them in the states here. Yeah, well, we seem to have a ton. It's probably because like there's not a whole lot to do, and we drink a lot. Speak for yourself. That... <laughs> I met here in Southeast Alaska, where it should rain all the time. Um, so I actually have a show recommendation for Tom, since you like Dharma and Greg so much, Uh-oh. and you have some, you have time to binge something. Uh, have you heard of uh, the one Garrett Dillahunt was in called uh, Raising Hope? No. Okay, so it is a half-hour sitcom that has oh i can't even find how many seasons um he plays the father in the show and it is so funny it was on from 2010 to 2014 i'm currently i think still in season one and it's one of those shows that i have to rewind because i'm laughing so hard i don't hear the next line is it uh is it on netflix um, or Hulu or Shudder or any of these ones that I'm members of Amazon Prime, I believe. Oh, OK. Yeah, I have that, too. Yeah. Yeah. My sister actually when when I went down for my father's medical emergency, my other sister recommended it to me and we watched a couple of episodes on her laptop while we were uh, coming down from the day and the it being in the hospital and everything. And it is super funny. I I highly, highly recommend it. It's it Garrett Dillahunt is the dad and Martha Plimpton is the mom. Okay. I don't know. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know yeah. her. Yeah. So uh Cloris Leachman is great grandma. Oh, I love is that, Cloris is that, Leachman. Is that George Costanza's mom or Seinfeld's mom? Uh, I don't know. I've never wrong. watched Seinfeld. So she um, is one of the, one of the Zoria sisters in American Gods, which you have if you have not watched American Gods. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I she plays a funny character cuz she's uh and not to make light of it, but she has dementia and she's not always there and she's not always clothed. 
Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, it's. Do you never see anything, but it's just always like, Grandma, put your shirt back on, you know? And it's it's such a funny, funny show that I can't believe I missed the first time around. I mean, it's it's been fi- it's five years since the last episode. So, um, yeah. Raising Hope with Garrett Dillahunt. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah. I was hooked from episode one. So, yeah, that's the way I was with Dharma and Greg. I mean, I watched the first episode and I just I could not stop laughing. Throughout the entire series. It's fun to kind of rediscover actors that you didn't realize were in a ton of stuff that you liked. And all of a sudden they're in a show that you you absolutely love. And to go back and watch their body of work. Yeah. That, and uh, I also, she was, she was also in another movie that I saw. And she wasn't even credited. She was an angel. I forgot what movie Can't that hardly was. wait. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I saw that one just for, I think, Jennifer Love Hewitt. I'll take movie trivia for 600 Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely give that a try. Garrett, I, I like Garrett. Yep. Raising Hope. I am slowly making my way through Deadwood, but I got derailed by Game of Thrones, so... I second that. I got sidetracked by um, the rewatch of uh, Black Summer, mm. Chernobyl, and uh, what's the Neil Gaiman one? The new one. Good Omens. You watch way too Good much Omens. TV. <laughs> I do. I do. Which I will put a plug out there. If people are interested, we are going to be talking about Good o- Good Omens this summer, which is a Neil Gaiman book. Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett wrote it back together in the 1990s, and Amazon just made it into a miniseries. Yes. Oh, that's a, that's a miniseries? I thought it was a uh, regular series. I think they just are doing a miniseries. I am actually just done with episode five. There's six episodes and it looks like they're going to wrap up the book. And I saw a, yeah. a, an online thing from Neil Gaiman the other day saying that he doesn't really have plans to expound upon the, the writing that he's already done in that universe. Well, and the, the big name actors in the show, Michael Sheen and David Tennant and even John C. Hamm, um, you know, they have a ton of other stuff going on. So I can't see them making a big commitment to a, a long running series. Well, and I just don't see that the series is going to go beyond where they're taking it. I mean, the the book is pretty much a story that has a beginning, middle, and end, and I I think yeah. that they're wrapping Stand it up alone. in six seasons in yeah. in the television series. But anyway, it's a it's a fun watch. It's a better it read, is. but it's a fun watch. I still have to read it, but I did watch <laughs> the whole thing. Um. What else? Just going back to fear. Do we have anything else that we want to say wrapping it up? I don't. Cause I don't, I think. I think it's running late for Tom. It's a little after midnight there, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's about quarter after 12. Yeah. That's right. I'm, I'm always up at this time anyway. Oh, man. Not me. No. Nope. <laughs> My my old body only needs like six hours sleep. Oh God! Oh no, we may get twenty four hours of sunlight up here uh, this time of year, but I am usually in bed by nine thirty. My old body wants more than six hours of sleep, but it doesn't let me get much more than that. <laughs> no, I get I get usually about six hours a night. Well, do we want to say anything more about CRM and this this group that tased Al, or do we just want to see how it evolves? I say let's see how it evolves. Yeah, it's too too much speculation right now. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true. Especially because there's no source material. Right. There are some people who are speculating that maybe it is the... Oh, God, I lost it. The community that... Commonwealth. Thank you. Yes, that's what I've I never even read go. the comics, and I know that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there are people that it's speculate that are speculating that it's the Commonwealth, but yeah, there's not really any real basis for the speculation at this point. It's all just speculation. 
Yeah. Other than they seem to have their stuff together. Everything is going to be speculation. Yep. It'll all be answered this season. I hope so. I hope they tie it up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they tied up season four. They did do a good job tying up season four. Yep. Yeah, I don't have any complaints about season four. I really enjoyed it. So I am, even though I was, felt like for me, this season got off to a bit of a rocky start. I'm there. I'm in for it. Well, you better be. You podcast about it every week. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm here till the bitter end. <laughs> Although Diane says she's here for it, but then she hangs up on us. Right. <laughs> God, I still don't know what I hit on the keyboard, but it was not good, whatever it was. It was catastrophic. I actually had to, like, reset my Skype password. And <laughs> wow. We were wondering. Yeah. Tom kept trying to call you back, and he yes. kept saying unavailable. Yeah. Yeah, whatever I did, I did it good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all fixed now. Yep. Well, so before so t- we finish up, um, I just wanted to say that there is a chance that in the future we may be doing a crossover with Aim for the Head podcast. Diana and I were talking about that a little bit today, so stay that would tuned be fun. for that. Um, it sounds like she is going to need a co-host for their coverage of episode three of Fear, so Marn, you and I need to talk about that. Oh. Yeah. Um, that would be fun. So look for us to... What am be- I, chop liver? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you got a friend, Diana, on Aim for the Head, if you haven't already. No, uh, I actually, I, th- I think I met her in Chicago. Yeah, she was a, she, I think she and Steve were both in Chicago. Yeah, I met both of them. They, uh, they were co-hosting some panels with a friend of mine. I really love them. I'm really glad that Rob recommended their podcast. I've really been enjoying them quite a bit. Yeah. Okay, Marn, you were going to say something to Tom, and I cut you off. I'm sorry. I well, didn't mean to. I was just going to say, uh, Tom, where can the people find you? You've got some pretty cool stuff online. Oh, uh, my Twitter and my Instagram are both the same, and it's Celtic T S O, my initials. So it's Celtic C E L T I C T S O. That's my Instagram and my Twitter. Definitely Ex- some fun Walking Dead related stuff. And Definitely. I'll, I'll post some stuff on the Biters page. Great. My Dharma and Tom picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're at uh, facebook.com slash Biters Podcast or on Facebook. Uh, I'm sorry, on Twitter, uh, Biters Podcast. And die you, the Gmail. <sighs> Just send it to Southgate Media. I'm so bad. And really, I, I hate to say it, but don't tweet us because I don't tweet as biters. I rarely tweet anyway. So, yeah, just Facebook us. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. You guys uh, have an Instagram? No. Uh, we I might. think we do, but it's tied, it's tied to our Twitter and Facebook. So it's basically the stuff that's posted on Twitter and Facebook. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so other than that, we still have an episode that Rob has to get out for us. And it was the season finale of Black Summer. Mm, I think he's actually posted that. Okay. Yeah, that one, that one was yeah. out. I think we're okay. caught up. I don't see it on the Facebook page. Well, you obviously don't download and listen to biters like some of us do. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand listening to myself. And plus, I don't have time. I watch too much TV. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's why Diane hangs up on you. Right. (laughs) (laughs) She's the reader. She reads all the stuff. I watch the shows. Oh, I'm reading this creepy serial killer book. (sighs) We really should have gotten in on the podcasting about serial killers. (laughs) On that note. (laughs) Yes. Alright everybody, have a good week. Have a good week. Bye.
Bye. Bye. Bye.